thanks everybody for coming. I'm really excited about this. I um, was really pleased when I, I first got here. Uh, David invited me to, uh, to let me know about this group, and I've been coming to it. And you know, I, I tell my folks back home like it's one of the real privileges of being at a university is that once a week you can go and sit on a talk by somebody who's really smart and does really interesting things, even if that doesn't pertain to your sort of day job, it's just a real, it's an opportunity to be part of the academy writ large. And uh, <laughs> I hope I don't disappoint uh, in how this keeps going. It's, it's gonna be my, my attempt here. I am a little, I don't know, there should be some sort of word that means both nervous and excited. Um, because I am a, a, a classically trained natural scientist and my PhD work was in molecular systematics. But now I don't do any of that, um, and I've, I've, through many, many different wanderings, I've moved closer and closer into doing this sort of coupled natural human system stuff. But as a card-carrying natural scientist, it's always a little nerve-wracking to present that to a group of social scientists. But um, we don't grow if we don't put ourselves in challenging situations. So I'm, I'm glad to be here, and I'm really excited to hear feedback about things that I could do better, things that I did all right, things that are methodologically abhorrent, I'd rather hear it from you than reviewer number two, um, so we can move forward. Uh, but uh, just wanted to give you an overview, sort of conflict and marine conservation has a long history and we won't spend a ton of time on that, but I do like to think about how my work uh, has arisen from and speaks to a, a tradition uh, in marine conservation. Uh, then we'll talk about oysters in New York and Rhode Island, a project that uh, is mostly wrapped up. Uh, we'll talk about a project that I think folks here might be interested in and that I'm ramping up, and that's looking at NGO governance uh, in, in marine conservation, specifically looking at mangroves in Fiji. And then I will wave my hands and talk about a path towards efficiency uh, as we go forward. So we'll see how it goes. So our story starts in Maine in 1887. And what's interesting about this uh, time was that we see that there was a single resource that had previously only been used by one group of stakeholders that suddenly, uh, because of technological and societal interventions, um, that single resource suddenly had another stakeholder that was competing for it. So the resource in question were menhaden, which are these um, sort of small semi-pelagic fish. Uh, and originally they were used uh, to bait cod hooks. So this was back when Maine had cod. Uh, and it was a huge industry at that point in time. So people would save for the, uh, the menhaden and then go out and they largely angled for cod at this point in time. Around the turn, around the 1880s, um, due to a, a wide uh, variety of factors, including uh, increased transportation efficiency out to the Midwest and the shift uh, from uh, native controlled to, uh, to settler controlled agrarian ecosystems out there, there was a sudden push for more and more fertilizer, and Menhaden could be uh, burnt into fertilizer-rich ash, which was then uh, shipped out there. And so suddenly you got a situation where two stakeholders had very uh, uh, non-overlapping desires for the same organism, because you can't use a fish simultaneously to bait for cod or to burn it and turn it into uh, ash. And so this is, can you guys see this? Right? I have a hell of a glare from here, but I oh, hope you guys are better. So this is an old photo from the NOAA archives of these Menhaden uh, kilns where they basically they would just catch fish and charcoal them into uh, this, this nitrogen rich ash. And this is from a, a bulletin from the United States Fisheries Commission, which talks about riots that broke out between the fisher, the cod fishermen, and the fertilizer fishermen, and then the cod fishermen actually burnt down several of these fertilizer uh, factories. So that I guess I, I mention this because I want to talk about this um, conflict arising over extractive fishing as uh, a long and unfortunate history in the U.S. And it obviously goes further back, but. It's not a history lesson. We fast forward to 75, uh, and we talk the uh, same idea, just a little bit further north, looking at the Grand Banks of Canada, where uh, Soviet fishing, industrial fishers would come over, and basically, prior to, um, prior to 79, you could go right up, basically, to shore and fish and bring those fish back. And so the Soviets were sending over these fleets that had um, uh, fishes like this, is the Andre Markin. Uh, which would go and set these big seines out for, uh, for fish, these big sort of balloon-like nets and haul them up. And those um, feeder ships would come back to the mothership, and the mothership had the capability of taking fish in the front and producing fish sticks out in the back. 
uh, and they would be doing all the processing right there. And so you would have all of that sort of value added labor. Uh, you would turn the fish into this sort of high quality product, which was then brought back to, at that point in time, what was uh, Leningrad um, for further distribution in there. And the Canadians, you know, object understandably, were, uh, were furious that all of their, what they viewed as their, their natural resources were being shipped off and they weren't really seeing any benefit from it. And this ultimately led to um, the creation of the EEZs, these exclusive economic zones, a, a, a policy whereby 200 nautical miles off the shore were, um, is considered uh, the domain of the host country. And you can fish there, but you have to pay the host country to fish there or you have to fly that flag. And I don't have time for it today, but this is super interesting in, um, in thinking about uh, colonial aspects of marine conservation. Um, there's contested zones. There's also opportunities in what are called these donut holes, which are little slivers of open ocean surrounded by EEZs that people are thinking about those as potentially being large scale of blue water marine protected areas uh, because you have to go through state waters to get to it. That's for next semester's lecture. Um, and even last year, uh, and this is kind of, I told you it was my fourth slide, right? Mm -hmm. So there are still this idea that climate mediated diaspora are facilitating um, conflict over fish because as areas grow drier and crops become less stable, people are turning towards the oceans for uh, reliable sources of proteins and micronutrients. And that kind of falls back with the last slide, looking at EEZs, you get situations where people are claiming little spits of land, or in some cases, building new islands so that they can claim the 200 nautical mile radius around those islands. So there's a long and ongoing history of conflict in fisheries, and it often, um, gets managed through acts, through limiting people's rights. And you can think about that as limiting access. So this is a marine protected area, you can't go fishing in here, or for limiting effort. So if you want to go fishing, you need a New York State fishing license. And so you can, the state can either limit people's access to those fisheries through, uh, through spatial or effort means. But, uh, and these, I, I call it the state, but it also can be managed through informal regulations. And we can chat later about some of the um, sort of village-based conservation projects in Fiji. That's what actually brought me there the first time. But fundamentally, we think about this as sort of an antagonistic situation where there are haves and have-nots, or there's a limited resource that's being um, coveted by groups, and those the use of those groups, groups are not overlapping. Again, think of those in Haiti. So... Um, how do we get to yes, right? How do we go from this antagonistic uh, fighting over fish to a position where people can come together, right? So we are both conflict and collaboration here, so I thought I'd try to talk about that. Um, and I, I think I'm biased because I'm a scientist, but I think science has an important role to play here by helping managers come up with policies that are consistent. So from year to year, you can expect roughly the same thing. That's important because buying a ship is not cheap. And so if you are going to enter into the fishery, there's a huge capital in, out, expenditure at the beginning in order to go buy your ship, your crew, your nets, et cetera. We're talking low millions of dollars. You want to be able to know that for the next 15 years, you're going to be able to fish. And if there's that inconsistency, it makes it really hard for people to, uh, to maintain uh, a, a stable fishery. You want those policies to be transparent. Right, no black boxes. Black boxes breed inequities, which we'll get to in a second, and and breed uh, distrust of the system. So you want to make sure that everybody knows how decisions are made, and then one would hope that those decisions are equitable, so that all all potential stakeholders have uh, <coughs> at least equal, if not proportional, access to that fishery. Um, again, and I think science has ways to help provide uh, policies that meet these three criteria while still also being sustainable. I, didn't, I guess I didn't put that in because that is so ingrained in how I think that we, we wouldn't want to talk about fish, managing a fishery in a non-sustainable fashion, but I should make that explicit. So this is where I'm going to um, put on my homemade social scientist hat and talk about some of the theory that's underlying it. And I hope people are still talking about this because I thought it was super useful. So um, Cash and others in 2003 came up uh, with uh, some theory about how to best uh, make sustainable, uh, the sustainable development goals, how to best, science can best influence those uh, millennium sustainable, sustainability goals. 
And they thought that the best role that science could have is through these three uh, fundamental attributes of it. So science can provide information that's credible, right? So we don't make stuff up, right? So we go through the scientific, a rigorous sort of hypothetical testing uh, situation where we come up with, with empirical and replicable data. That information has to be salient, though. So if you're talking about a tuna industry and I roll up with really, really scientifically valid data on starfish, that's not really going to help. So it has to be credible. It has to be salient. <clears throat> and importantly, and this is the stuff that really gets me excited, it has to be legitimate. So in a fishery where there are so many different stakeholders who are constantly uh, vying for access, um, those stakeholders if, need to have their voices heard. And if the science is seemed to be pejorative or exclusionary, that undermines how uh, the legitimacy of the science. And those stakeholders who are... Uh, on the outside during those con conversations feel excluded from the conservation coming out of there. So we want to make sure that the science that we do hits all of these three points. Yes, sir. So why uh, use salient? Why not just use relevant? It's more... That's the word he used, okay. and so that's the, the language that has been sort of perpetual. This has been cited a bunch of times and is still being used in here. Um, and that's the way that he did, and so I'm couching it in there so that if other people are kind of reading it, they kind of see sort of methodologically or, or philosophically where I'm linking back to. But yes, that would be a, a, perhaps a better synonym to choose. So ultimately, I see scientists serving as this referee for policy. Um, it, it serves as a way to help frame these arguments and come up with a... Uh, a philosophical system that we all agree is valuable and therefore can help um, bring some credibility towards the policies that come out of it. Plus, I really was trying to find a way to use this. <laughs> it's so awesome. I don't really need this slide, but I'm a big fan of comic books, and so I was glad to be able to throw that in. So, um, given that, I wanted to talk about some of the work that I've been doing and trying to see how it interacts with that theory. And so I want to start off with one project looking at oysters in Rhode Island or New York. And we start off in New York thinking about ecosystem services in the city that never sleeps, uh, except for that guy, he had a rough night. Um, but this is a picture from the 1880s of Red Hook, Brooklyn. And these are all oyster shells. So the cities of Brooklyn and Manhattan, which used to be separate cities, um, during the 1870s had over 10,000 people involved in the oyster processing. Uh, and the annual income that they were bringing in, in today's dollars, was in the hundreds of millions of dollars. And this is, uh, it's New York City has a long history. Um, one can argue that New York City is literally built upon the oyster industry. So this is a British survey map from the 1840s showing the original bedrock of Manhattan and then the constructed part of Manhattan. So lower Manhattan has always been valuable. Back in the day, what people did for property was just make their own. It actually kind of harkens back to what people are doing now with EEZs. Back in uh, the 1820s and 30s, what they would do is build a seawall about 10, maybe 40, 50 feet offshore, and then get oyster shells and fill it in, or garbage and fill it in. Um, and they would then create new land and then slap uh, structures on top of it. And you can actually see this uh, related uh, in, uh, in sort of the, the nominative fashion of today's geography, right? So there's Pearl Street, so-called because there were a lot of oysters around, although these weren't pearl-bearing oysters. Then there's Water Street, which used to be on the water, but we then built further out. So then there's Front Street, which used to be on the waterfront, but again, we built further out. And finally, there's South Street, where the FDR is. Um, in about the 1840s, they had to ban that process because if you look back at the original legislation, they were concerned that they were going to close off the Hudson, that people were just going to build lower Manhattan all the way over to New Jersey because those housing, or the, the real estate market, even back then, was bonkers. So we no longer harvest oysters in New York. Uh, thanks to a, a, a Gloria epidemic in the 1920s. People haven't been able to harvest oysters commercially since 1927, but there's still a really strong interest in using this cultural and historical affinity for oysters in thinking about what we want New York to look like in the future. So the idea of using the a past to build a resilient future, and part of that takes place, or is manifested in the Billion Oyster Project, which I'm not a part of, but I'm a big fan of. The idea is that they want to plant a billion oyster spat around New York Harbor, 
and integrate that into education, integrate uh, into climate resiliency, into urban land planning. The idea is to create these living shorelines. And this really got um, sort of lemonade out of lemons when Superstorm Sandy, which I can always screw up when I say in public, came through in 2012, a lot of lower Manhattan and, and um, southwestern Brooklyn got really hammered in part because we didn't have these living shorelines. And having seen how vulnerable we were as a community towards, uh, towards climate change, there was a big push to start thinking about redesigning that area. And oysters came up <clears throat> as a organism that could do a couple different ecosystem services. It, because they're filter feeders, they help clean the water. But because they're a reef building, so they aggregate on top of each other, they build these, uh, these living breakwaters. So when you have those storm surges coming through, rather than just smashing up against a hard, flexible, um, sort of human-generated structure of flooding the subways, they hit these oyster berms first, and that wave energy gets dispersed. Now, moving to the northeast, we can look at Rhode Island. This is a 1911 picture showing all these oyster shells outside of one of the fishery. Those oysters were all wild caught, and not, perhaps not surprisingly, there's not a ton of wild caught oysters anymore. But there still is a really valuable <coughs> $6.2 million a year valuable oyster aquaculture industry in Rhode Island. And that also supports a lot of other uh, sort of, uh, I don't know that there's a, an economic term for it, but I would call them epithetic because I'm a biologist, industry. So there's uh, a Rhode Island oyster bike tour. There are um, Rhode Island oyster beer tours you can take. There's oyster B&Bs that are all set around. So this is as much as a, a cultural production as it is a biological production. And they're on Instagram and you can, you know, they're social media savvy and you can go interact with them. And, and I'm not um, a huge oyster fan for consumption personally, but it, there's almost like oyster sommiers. There's, you can get oysters with like hints of of copper, which is probably really bad, <laughs> or, um, you know, they, they have the, the notes and the flavors like you would see in fine wines expressed in the oysters so that these are, uh, they're, these individual sort of boutique fisheries are arguing that they are not fungible, that the, the Bluff Hill Cove oyster has a unique taste signature that you wouldn't get from other places. I don't know, I can't do it, but there are people who can and more power to them. So what's interesting that it's all the same critter though. I mean, we have the same organism, the same shellfish is being used in uh, a landscape architecture context in New York Harbor and is being used for Bon Appetit magazine uh, 120 miles to the northeast, but it's the same thing. And so this reminds me of those Medhaven stories where you've got the same oyster that is um, fulfilling multiple ecosystem roles, but those roles are largely incompatible. Right, so like here are all the oyster restaurants in Lower Manhattan. Here are all the shellfish bed closures in Lower Manhattan. So these are not coming from here, right? So you don't want to eat the oysters out of the East River. If there's one point you take home from this lecture, <laughs> don't eat shellfish from the East River, right? It's gross. Um, and similarly here, right, these, this is the, the, all the oysters, the Rhode Island Oyster Bike Trail kind of comes up around here and ends up in Providence. Um, so here we've got these sort of uh, two different cultures that are using the oysters for very, very different things. And what I wanted to do was to think about how the stakeholders involved in these oyster industries differ and what areas make them similar. And essentially we wanted to ask the question, um, is a New Yorker more like a New Yorker, or are an academic more like an academic, right? So we've got three different stakeholders. We've got NGOs, state and local governments, and academics operating both in New York and in Rhode Island. And we wanted to see sort of how these stakeholders conceptualize what these mental models of oyster system services look like, and then if there are similarities. Um, and those similarities might perhaps provide us opportunities for thinking about con uh, collaboration and, um, and, and moving forward with these. We did try to contract commercial growers and tribal governments when we were doing the interviews, the commercial growers were all out planting their seeds, they just were too busy to get to us and the tribal governments were probably inundated, they didn't get back to us. However, that's something that I'm hoping to, uh, to do if the fine people at New York Sea Grant want to give me money. Um, so to look at this, we use a technique called fuzzy cognitive mental models. Has anybody done that in here? 
It's a super powerful program. Okay, cool. Are, are you familiar with it? Or Okay, well, I'll walk you through it. So the idea is that you could have, it, it's all couched in sort of graph theory networks. So you have these two nodes, and they're connected by edges, and those edges go uh, asymmetrically. So you could have A influencing B different than B influences A. And for each edge, you have two values. One is the magnitude of the relationship, and one is the confidence of the relationship. Now, I learn best from simple examples. So one of the things that I like to do when I, when I teach this is we talk about uh, GPA and studying. And so there's probably a relationship between GPA and studying. So the more you study, in theory, your GPA should go up or down. That's not, not there's an actual, I'm, I'm involving the audience in here. <laughs> so if you study more, does your GPA go up or down? Yes, okay, so that would be a positive relationship. How, I, I'm a little nervous out asking that, right? So how confident are you all in this relationship? Yeah. Moderate, very, okay. So we would, if we were doing this, hopefully I would have more audience participation if I was doing this for real. <laughs> Y'all are looking like deer in headlights at this point in time. So here we would have a GPA box and we would have a positive arrow to, or a uh, study box and a positive arrow to your GPA box. So the, high, the more your G, you study, the higher your GPA is going to be. And we would have an X would be fairly high because despite the sort of tepid reaction here, <laughs> there's fairly good evidence that if you study more, you do better. Um, and we would feel pretty confident in that relationship. So your X would be high and your Y would be high. So what, in this case though, Influent, you having a higher GPA doesn't necessarily, it, it's a unidirectional. So in this case, we probably wouldn't have that arrow, but the model, the, the software allows for those to exist. So what we do is then expand that out. So we don't look at just binary systems, but we look at all possible interactions. And ultimately what we end up with <clears throat> are things that look like bowls of spaghetti. And I'm not going to uh, make you try to read small font here, but this is what the New York Academic Group looks like. Um, we gave them 15, we gave everybody 15 terms to start, just so there would be some similar nodes in there, but we encouraged our group to add stuff or, and we, and, or subtract stuff. And we threw a dummy variable in there, and we threw a, a little bit of a trick in there. We had pearls. Nobody is here is involved with pearls. The oysters don't really produce pearls on a commercial system. So just to check that they were actually reading our list, we threw something that made no sense in there and they all threw that out, which made me feel pretty comfortable that they were actually just kind of, not just blindly following the rules, but critically thinking about it. So we can look at the New York Academic and then just sort of squint. There's the Rhode Island Academic. They both look like big bowls of spaghetti. They're both pretty complex. Um, when you look at the NGO, it's a little less complex, and if you were to spend time or do the statistical analyses, which I have done and I'm sparing you all from, these are uh, different. They have different topologies. What that means is that despite these groups, the, the Rhode Island academics and the Rhode Island NGOs, literally being in the same boat as they go out to replant <laughs> oysters, um, they have fundamentally different views on how the oyster ecosystem is organized. And that, to me, is an opportunity for inefficiencies to be built into the system. Because if you have people who think that there is a, a fundamental relationship between two variables, uh, and they think that those relationships are the same, are, um, but if, or think that those are different, then acting in one way is going to produce different outputs depending on what your mental model is. Uh, similarly, the Rhode Island government was a little less complex and also different. Um, so what we ended up finding, though, and again, I'll... Um, we, we took data, or we took a methodology from community ecology, uh, which basically allows us to look at how similar uh, ecosystems are. So if you give me a list of flowers and butterflies in six different plots, I can tell you how similar those are. We took these terms and essentially turned those into species, and we had the plot be the stakeholder group. And we're using those uh, statistical techniques, we found that basically nobody agreed with each other. Um, <laughs> Rhode Islanders and New Yorkers were, on average, slightly more like other Rhode Islanders and other New Yorkers than uh, sort of academics were to academics. So if you had to really press me, I would say it's more where you are than what hat you're wearing, but the values were not significant. It's just the, the, the average similarity was higher. Horrible, right? So everybody thinks the system works completely different, yet we're asking all of these people to interact with each other. Um, 
there was some areas of hope though. So these are, the centrality score is essentially how um, important each one of these groups were. And again, I'm, I, I'm just showing you that I have data. I don't need you to read the table because um, talks like that suck. Uh, the idea is different groups had different priorities is what came out of that. So they, nobody had the same uh, atop the, uh, as their number one priority. But if you dig into the data a little bit, you do see that there is points of agreement. And so this is my, my, op, my natural optimism coming through here, is that even though those groups all had fundamentally different topologies, they all had three things that showed up in their top five. So not awesome, but something I think we can work with. And those things that showed up were, I can't see it, oh yeah, uh, coastal residents, as a sidebar, as a Yankees fan, showing this picture of Fenway kind of kills me, but it's the best picture I had at the moment. Uh, water quality and structural complexity. So everybody recognized that if you don't have local people involved, your measures aren't going to work. Good, right? That's, that's a sort of a fundamental axiom of conservation is that we have to involve local people. Filter feeding organisms, things that are immersed their entire lives in the water, it makes sense that water quality would also pop up in there. And then structural complexity is important, but for two different reasons. We talked about the importance of structural complexity in terms of absorbing wave energy, but in Rhode Island, this is also where a lot of thin fish, uh, their larvae settle in. So it's important for a different reason, but it doesn't mean that it's not important. Um, but so both groups kind of recognize that having um, really tall, com topographically complex reefs with little nooks and crannies, that's the sort of stuff that we want. We don't want necessarily a, f a flat sort of mud uh, horizontal surface with a couple of oysters on it. So I'm gonna, uh, I was really interested about this and, and we've submitted that for publication. It's been in review for about two months, so it didn't get desk rejected, so I'm happy about that. Um, but emboldened by that, we've been carrying on another program, asking similar questions and similar methodologies, but in a different area. And that's looking at conservation prioritization of mangroves. And so for most of my academic career, I've been blessed to be able to do work in the South Pacific, particularly in Fiji. And much of that work has been funded through um, Packard, MacArthur, sort of big grants to large NGOs who then um, who, who apply for money and set conservation priorities at an international level. And I'm really interested in looking at how the priorities for conservation that are set at places like this is WWF's DC headquarters, how the priorities set here get enacted here, which is their Fiji headquarters in the uh, capital of Suva, and ultimately how those conservation priorities get translated at the national level, but ultimately get expressed in places like this, which is uh, village Gilai in Fiji. It's about 70 uh, households. It's, it's about three kilometers away from the shore, and those three kilometers are all mangroves. Right? So we can come up with great ideas in D.C., but the rubber hits the road when people in, in the village decide to cut down or not to cut down mangroves or to harvest one endangered species of fish versus a really common species of fish. This is where conservation actually takes place. And so I'm really interested in seeing how these perceptions of ecosystem services differ along this, uh, this sort of pipeline with all of the, the power and information asymmetries inherent within it. So we, again, go back to the spaghetti diagrams and um, I wanted to highlight a couple different things here. Uh, so I am not showing the women's data. Men and women uh, are, are gender segregated in Fiji uh, to the point where I, as a man going into a village, uh, if I was to go up to a woman who I'm not related to, which is all of them, um, it would be, and talk to her about sort of her daily fishing behavior, that would be, as far as I understand, tantamount to me going to the mall and asking a woman I don't know how much she weighs. Like, I could do that, but in our society, that's a really, that's a taboo subject. Like, you don't just roll up and ask random people how much they weigh, right? And so that means that because there are so many more men involved in fisheries because of systemic sexism in the academy, and in STEM fields in general, right? Like, there's, there's a big uh, gender inequity in that. Because most of the people who have been carrying out that research have been men, most of the reported data have come from men, and that has been uh, systematically marginalizing and making women's labor invisible. I wanted to address that within the system, so we have data for the women, but culturally because 
I'm a man and it would be inappropriate for me to talk about the women's data. I do have them. And if you know my female colleagues were here, we could tag team it, but I'm just gonna show you the men's data for now. So that's why I mentioned that there's men, but then don't talk about the women. We're, we're thinking about this and trying to be sensitive about it. So that's one thing. The second thing I wanted to show you was this one note here, seabirds. I think this is a really interesting point to mention. Um, I, as we discussed, I grew up in Albany, right? Like I'm a white guy from upstate New York. I carry into my research a certain set of, uh, of privileges and a certain set of assumptions. And I want to be cautious about how I interpret data given those. In traditional Fijian culture, the groups in the village are arranged along what we would probably call clans. And those clans have totemic animals. So Waisea, my uh, collaborator there, is of the sea snake clan. We were out fishing and we saw a sea snake and it swam over and he said hi to it. And he didn't say hi to him in this sort of like Disney, <laughs> like, like there's gonna be like little flowers going around, but to him, that was a manifestation of his ancestors just checking in to see how his fishing was going, right? So they believe that there's this intergenerational transfer of information and of, of spiritual energy into these totemic animals. And so they have great reverence for these totemic animals because it's grandpa, right? And you don't want to be disrespectful to grandpa, so I say it's not disrespectful to the snakes. Now, one of the clans here has seabirds as a totemic animal. And in doing the interviews, one of the things that they said that I thought was really interesting is they said that in times of uh, when there are great storms, our ancestors come home to the mangroves to roost. I thought that was really interesting because I, as this you know white guy from upstate New York, would be aware of sort of seabirds using mangroves as a sheltering mechanism. And that's cool. Like, as an ecologist, I find that really interesting. But what additional significance that takes on when we actually ask the people who live there what this means to them. So that means that in an increasingly storm-filled world where there are more and more violent storms, mangroves take on this special precedence. They take on the significance of being a refuge for their ancestors. And if you want to talk about ecosystem services that resonate, and you want to talk about hooks to get people caring about ecosystems, that is a phenomenal one that unfortunately, because of those power and information asymmetries, doesn't always get back up the line so that people in DC don't necessarily talk about um, sacred sites and mangroves. But for the folks in the village, that makes a huge, huge difference. So that's the Gilai Men. The other village that we looked at in Nangmini, you can see just even when squinting, this is a much more complex map. And the reason we think is because um, of two things. One, this is, uh, forget Sabah Sabah, I don't have their data right now. Uh, I'm not presenting it. This is the average level of education. In Giwai, it, the average is about fourth grade. Um, and in Nainini, it's about sixth grade. So they're, they're significantly different. People in Nainini have more education. Also, the extremes are a lot higher. So there are people in Nainini who have gone off to university and come back. Additionally, Nainini is a lot easier to get to than Giwai. And so there have been uh, NGO um, information sessions going on in Nainini. And what we see is that in villages where there's more information, uh, this is sort of a Likert value of, of mangrove value. So like the higher it is, it's like a one to 10, 10 you strongly agree, like that sort of stuff. We can see that when they have, villagers have outside exposure to mangrove education, they are uh, significantly higher positive associations of mangroves. So we think that the reason why those two villages look so different is because people in Nainini have had a higher education. They've also had exposure to uh, NGOs um, doing educational outreach. So I like this because we spend a lot of time doing and talking about the value of education and outreach with local communities. And sometimes I feel like we say that's a good thing because we feel like it's a good thing, but I like to see that there's data showing that it actually makes a difference because you know, thinking about inefficiencies, here we've got a good data to support that there is some return on that investment of expenditures, that we can um, alter people's perceptions in a positive way to thinking about their natural environment. So that's the, the local village level. We then zoom up to that, uh, that interstitial level. I, I like to think of the national level as almost a boundary organization because they, they exist in these two worlds, one where they have to go out to Gilai and Nainini and do those outreach events, but then they're also getting influence from 
you know, the, the bosses in New York and D.C. and London who are saying this is how globally we want to think about mangrove conservation. And so you can see this is a bigger one. There are, it's more complex and it has more components in it. I want to bring your attention up to here. So here they're expressly thinking about conservation. They're thinking about government policies. There's urban expansion. There's, um, they're thinking about sort of squatters' rights. So when you move from the village to this, this liminal or this boundary-spanning organization, they're starting to expand the purview of what happens in a mangrove, and they're starting to think more formally about um, you know, upland development or climate change. If you look at, and you probably didn't because I zoomed through it, things like climate change and um, carbon dioxide don't appear at the village level. The impacts of climate change, like storm surge does, but not the, so it's a, that's the ultimate, but not the, it's not the proximal, but not the ultimate, right? But the, the underlying causes don't show up here. They're starting to show up. Um, if we then zoom out a little bit more to go to WWF's international, you can see this is a big old mess. But it's, what that means is that there, this is larger, both in number of terms and in complexity. And they're starting to think, again, at a bigger scale. So you think, see things like corruption and community resources, political will, national government policy, social cohesion, sorts of things that are probably very comfortable terms for folks in this room to think about. That They do show up, but they only show up at sort of the big international level, which one could argue that's an appropriate scale to be talking about corruption at. So... When I graph these out, and, and again, I can do stats on these that I'm not boring you with showing levels of connection, we can see that the Fijian villages are all much more alike each other than they are the other groups. But as you move up, you get this sort of nested situation. So you've got the two villages, or you've got both genders. I, there's actually a third gender in Fiji, but there weren't enough people expressing that gender for me to interview them in a, a meaningful fashion. So I am... Um, I guess, unfortunately, uh, minimizing their impact, but it's a, it's a sample size issue. Uh, but you can see that the villages or the, the people in the villages are largely overlapping, and then you get this sort of nested thing. And one of the analyses that we're doing on now is we can actually formally test the level of nestedness. I've got a colleague at SUNY Brockport who is working on those data, and I need to text her to send them to me because I want to move on with this. Uh, but I, the idea is that as you move away from it, the village, your your worldview expands and more things start getting to be important. Well, the downside to that is that the value of any individual node starts becoming decreased because of that. And although this graphic shows that it is a perf perfect nestedness, seabirds weren't present in DC. Now, when I told them that, they were super stoked and they're like, you need to publish this so we can cite it. So they're amenable to hearing those things, but because of the way that structure, the, the structural um, power flows, there's not really avenues for those uh, really important but individual focus foci to be able to be formally heard at the international level. What this means, though, is that some of the things that are appearing at the DC level aren't showing up at the village level. And this is where those inefficiencies come in. So one of the things that showed up was a blue carbon economy, uh, carbon credits, right? So I'm about to fly internationally and I can go donate $75 to help offset the amount of carbon that I'm putting in. A lot of those turn out to be mangrove reforestation programs. That uh, is something that matters a lot at the international level. But when you talk to the villagers, like blue carbon economy, carbon credits, climate change, um, carbon dioxide in general, all of that isn't part of how they think mangroves work. And so you get a situation where people could come in give this big presentation to the villagers, the villagers will you know, politely clap, and then as soon as the NGO guys leave, the villagers are just going to do what they're doing anyway because there was a failure to communicate. There was a sort of a information asymmetry there or that there wasn't this resonant. And so all of that money y'all just spent to go out to the village was essentially pissed away, right? That was an inefficiency in the system. You could reallocate those funds. It's like 1500 bucks to fly to Fiji. You could reallocate that $1,500 either to spinning a story that works better or doing a process that resonates with the local folks to get a better idea. So again, though, I'm not completely uh, pessimistic about the situation because if you look at that, those centrality things, there were some ideas that continued to pop up throughout all of the different levels. So uh, men and women's livelihoods both showed up as being really important. People understand that mangroves are engines of economic um, uh, 
development. This is especially important for women because women don't have a lot of economic autonomy in Fiji, or certainly less so than the men. And the, through access to gender-specific fisheries like mud crabs, things like that, they're able to, um, to have money of their own. Right, and that, that economic autonomy helps with civil rights, helps with reproductive rights. Like, it's a good thing, and I think everybody kind of recognizes that. Not surprisingly, when you interviewed the men about what the women were doing, they didn't really have much of an idea, and if you interviewed the women about what the men were doing, they thought certain things were more important than the men did. And so, even though these were husband and wives, they kind of had, uh, it, it, it underscores that gender segregation, because essentially they would go off and do their own thing and then come back. Um, the other point of agreement was, was fisheries. So mangroves uh, have fisheries of their own, like those mud crabs that I mentioned. But they're, they've got these really cool, long buttress roots. So they've, they've these roots that sort of go down. And so when you go through a mangrove forest, the flooded part, there are all these interstitial spaces. There are these, these long, uh, thin roots that create these hidey holes through it. And that's great for reef fish larvae to go. It's sort of like the minor leagues for for reef fish. They learn how to be a fish in a mangrove forest. Then when they get bigger, they get called up to the bigs and they move out onto the reef. And so when you lose mangroves, you lose those valuable nursery areas. And so reef fisheries suffer as well. And so that was something that everybody thought was important. And these obviously tie into each other as well. But much like in the Rhode Island example, here instead of um, focusing on carbon credits and missing the boat, I would argue that there might be other avenues that you could go and start that conversation with, engage people on these commonalities, and then use that to open the door to expand the discussion to things that matter otherwise. So maybe you come in and you talk about reef fisheries, and then as, a, you know, as Dr. NGO, you then talk about carbon credits. But at the same time, because you're talking about fisheries, then you know, the, the Fijian uh, villagers are going to be able to talk about the spiritual connection. And so those conversations wouldn't occur, though, if you kind of came in saying, you know, I'm a, I know exactly what I want to talk about, and that shuts down the conversation. So I'd like to think of it, um, well, I'll, I'll summarize that a little bit more here. But moving forward, um, you know, we, we think that there are, that there is definitely going to be this conflict, and the conflict can manifest itself either in sort of obvious things like flaming factories, or it can lame it, ex, uh, express itself in hidden ways, like these inefficiencies that we've been talking about. But it Regardless, it puts a stress on that system. And I think that I hopefully have, have convinced you that using pro programs like this mental modeling software, looking about being explicit about stakeholder engagement, might find ways to reduce that stress and maybe come up with novel approaches that weren't necessarily apparent to begin with. Um, and then circling back around, you know, we want to do credible and salient, but this is really the legitimate part here because we're finding avenues to get all of those stakeholders to have their values heard and when there are differences among them, try to spend that extra effort to find the areas of commonality, right? And so I like to think of it um, sort of as global versus local optima, right? So if you, your local optima might be um, carbon credits, uh, and if you focus only on your local optima, if you try to optimize the system just for what makes uh, sense for you, you ultimately don't get the, the highest output. But if you zone down a little bit and look for global optima that are shared, um, you might be able to find ways to move forward where maybe not everybody gets their number one, but the average amount of success or collaboration across the system is, uh, is greatly increased. Um, so I guess just trying to tie this all together, you know, moving forward, this is something that I'm really excited about continuing to do. I'm putting in a, an NSF grant to do more of the, the mangrove stuff. I'm particularly interested in seeing how uh, temporally stable those those mental models are. Uh, you know, we saw that people's opinions can change after education, but even if you don't, did I just hit people on a certain day and am I extrapolating <laughs> out because they had, you know, eggs for breakfast as opposed to porridge? I want to, if we're really going to say that these are important things to know, I want to make sure that there's some stability there. Um, I'm also really interested in looking at ecological tipping points. So if we know that mangroves are important because they uh, buffer against storms, is it one species of mangroves? Is it, do you need four species to get that service? Or do you just need a certain amount of, of hectares of coverage? And so moving forward, one of the big projects that hopefully those students I mentioned that I'm bringing in will be looking at the relationship between the sort of the species richness and at what point 
a number of species do you start seeing these uh, ecosystem services coming up so that we can think about protecting species in the way that makes sense to the residents who live there. So with that, I want to uh, thank my family. This has all been uh, largely unfunded, which means <laughs> self-funded, which means my wife chipped in a lot for this research. <laughs> um, and also, I mean, besides sort of the financial contributions, right, we've got two adorable but uh, rambunctious kids. And while they have been able to go in some of the field work with me, a lot of this field work has been with Anna watching the boys back home. And, uh, you know, I don't want that labor, uh, which facilitated all the stuff that you just saw, to be unrecognized. So thanks to my family for making this happen. Uh, thank you all very much for listening.